Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Donald J. Robertson. He's a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist who practiced in London for 20 years, ran a training school for therapists, and is particularly known for his work on Stoic philosophy. He's the author of some very interesting books to include Build Your Resilience, Stoicism and the Art of Happiness, and most recently, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. Available in hardcover and as an audiobook, which is a lot of fun if you're into audiobooks because Donald's an experienced instructional designer, a sought after public speaker. He's got an engaging voice and an appealing accent, which you are about to hear. He specializes in the relationship between philosophy, psychology, and self improvement, especially for people with social anxiety and self confidence issues. And he takes some esoteric concepts and makes them firmly practical. So open your ears, open your mind, and be prepared to be inspired by our guest today, Donald J. Robertson. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> So this is John Spencer from the Modern War Institute. Good morning. This is uh, Dr. John Sullivan. I'm uh, a senior fellow with the uh, Small Wars Journal, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Donald Robertson, author of How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, and welcome to the Break It Down Show. Yeah, this is fantastic. Donald's in Toronto today, and he took uh, some time on a Sunday morning to talk with me about his fantastic book, How to Think Like a Roman, and, uh, and uh, or How to Think Like a Roman, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And there is, well, there's a lot. You guys for sure should go to his website and check him out. Uh, it's donaldrobertson.name. Donaldrobertson.name. Just exactly how I said it. And if you can't find that, you can find him on Twitter, and that's Don J. Robertson. And I'll, as always, just hit me up at P. Day Turner, and I'll direct you to Don uh, myself if, if needs be. But hey, uh, thanks for coming on, and, and I'm just fascinated by what you do in the body of work. Good grief, man. There's so much stuff out there. I wanted to, like any good academic, I wanted to find some terms, because some of this stuff is pretty simple, but some of it... It gets dicey, and then he uh, said the, yeah. it requires context. So can you tell me, in terms of the book and everything else, like Stoics, you know, they break things down into segments. So when when they talk about wisdom, wisdom is the thing that I, I ask a lot of guests about because we've got access to all the information in the world, but are we any wiser? I'm trying to color that and give me your take on, on what the Stoics would say and how you see it in a modern context. Well, the first thing I'd say about the Stoics, actually, is I think of them as very much being in the Socratic tradition. Like, So I think we can learn a lot. They're not doing exactly the same sort of philosophy as Socrates, but they inherit a lot of their arguments from Socrates. And that helps to shed some light on their reasoning. Stoicism, in some ways, is kind of like a bullet point version of Socrates. In the Socratic dialogues, we get all the arguments justifying things. But then in the surviving stoic text and we only really have about one percent of the texts that existed in the ancient world what we have more are, are like in, instructions and aphorisms and the kind of conclusions that are drawn and the techniques and so on rather than the philosophical arguments to justify them but the the stoic idea of wisdom socrates would say well like, there's different types of wisdom and knowledge but the type that really improves our quality of life is the type of wisdom that consists in understanding what's most important in life so you could call that practical wisdom okay. or moral wisdom. You know, it's a particular type of wisdom about what's healthy for us, what's good for us, and what the best possible type of life consists in. So Socrates sometimes calls it wisdom concerning the highest things or the most important things in life. And the, the Stoics give a more formulaic de definition. They say the type of wisdom they're on about consists in knowing the nature of the good like man's supreme good, the goal of life, and really grasping that firmly, or knowing the difference between good, bad, and indifferent things, or we could say knowing the difference between right and wrong. So a kind of moral or practical wisdom. So that actually perfectly brings me into my next definition, morals, right? Mores, morality. It's tough because uh, your morals aren't my morals, but we all share a common morality. 
what the heck do we do? Same same setup. Um, you know, how did they see morals, and then how does it apply to co- uh, modern time through your eyes? Well, it seems to me, you know, what the Stoics, the Stoicism is a virtue ethic. So it's not based around the kind of, it's more of a top down than a bottom up approach. So they're not so much specifically saying do this or do that at a concrete specific level, because when it comes to making particular decisions, like should I give money to this particular homeless guy or not, there's also factual knowledge that would come into the equation. Like, is this guy using drugs or not? I don't know. I'd need to find that out in order to maybe know what the right decision is in this circumstance. So Stoics are more concerned, though, with the fundamental, more abstract or more general principles of morality. And sometimes there's uncertainty about how we would apply that in practice, and they understand that. But they would say, look, the main thing is that we're making an effort to act with fairness and kindness and justice towards our fellow men, although we might disagree about how to actually interpret that in practice. But the most important thing is that we're committed to doing that, and the worst thing is if we don't even bother trying. Mm -hmm. They would say, look, the main thing is, commitment to acting virtuously and then we'll work out the details but the big problem is if we do the opposite or don't even bother making an effort to try and so they would say well we can learn a lot about morality they thought by looking at the qualities that we find most admirable in other people and as a therapist as well I find that a good inroad so people will often say well I don't know what justice means and I'll say to them well think about people that you admire or you consider praiseworthy in terms of their moral character who are your heroes in life And it could be people you know, it could be your mum or your dad or your buddy at work. It could be some guy you've heard about. It could be a character in a movie. They don't even have to be a real person. It could be Marcus Aurelius, a historical figure that you admire. And then ask yourself, what is it that you actually find admirable about the way they conduct themselves? And that's your in to try and clarify your own moral values. And the Stoics and Socrates knew that as well. It's often by looking at other people what we admire about them, that we can learn about the qualities that we should start to exemplify in our own lives. If you get people to draw up a list of the things they find most admirable about other people, and then you ask them, how many of those qualities do you actually exemplify yourself? The majority of people will kind of look slightly awkward and go, well, not many. (laughs) You know, because we kind of actually do all know what we think is, is the human ideal, what's praiseworthy and moral. We've at least got a rough idea. But for some reason, we, you know, we tend to avoid or pr- procrastinate or postpone actually putting it into practice ourselves. And the Stoics want us to get past that block. Yeah, because the day-to-day life, when you do walk up and walk by that person on the ground who maybe could use some help, and you're not sure that maybe the best way to help is to give that person 20 bucks. Maybe it's to instead yeah. buy them a sandwich. Maybe it's buy them a drink because that's how their body survives at this point. You just you don't know. but. If you do nothing, then, yeah, you do lose that morality point, you know, for for taking no opportunity to help. Yeah, and the Stoics would say, look, what Stoicism tells you is that it is important, like it is praiseworthy. It does does contribute to human flourishing if we try to help other people. Now, how do we help them? That's a more complicated question, and there may be scope for disagreement about that and historical stoics we know argued with each other about some of the practical implications of morality but they agreed about the general principle that we should be committed to living with uh, with virtue and moral wisdom and they thought the main thing is to latch on to that you know and then we'll work out the details later you had said early on in your description of morality you talked about ethics and that turns out that is my next term to describe because as a guy who's seen a lot of, of the worst of humanity um, ethics are absolutely situational. There's just no way around it, and and they're driven powerfully, I believe, by culture. But I wanted to get your kind of interpretation, same setup, you know, how, how the Stoics viewed it and, and how you see it in today's modern times. So the Stoics were what we call ethical naturalists. They weren't relativists or subjectivists. They didn't think it was kind of subjective or a free-for-all in terms of morality. Aristotle has a famous saying that fire burns both in Athens and in Persia, but men's sense of morality differs from one place to another. He says it's strange. The laws of physics are the same the world over, but morality seems to vary. And actually, he was kind of half right, because we know now from modern research, we can do research on moral values today. And researchers who have used questionnaires to study people's values have found a surprising amount of consistency again, at the abstract level. So most people think that it's moral to try and help other people and to treat other people fairly and justly. 
Um, most people think it's admirable to have self-discipline and to exhibit courage in life. But the difference of opinion comes in when we, we question, well, how do you actually apply that in a particular situation? And the Stoics can offer us some guidance about that. But like I say, you know, the main thing they think is getting clear that exhibiting moral wisdom is more important, for example, than just avoiding pain or just living for the sake of pleasure mm. or living to boost your reputation or something like that. So they were kind of looking at the bigger picture and the more abstract values, if you like. But they also give us ways to figure out about specific situations. Again, it, it kind of comes partly from role modeling. So they would say, look at the people that you admire. And, you know, like saying, what would Jesus do? The Stoics literally say, what would Zeno or Socrates do? Zeno is the founder of Stoicism. So Epictetus, the most famous Stoic teacher, whose writing survived today, we know he said to his students, ask yourself in a particular situation, study the lives of great men that you admire, the founders of our school, Socrates and people like that. And then try and imagine what they would do in the situation that you're facing and use that as your kind of ruler or your guide in terms of morality. Yeah, and uh, how do you how do you take that excellent advice and then uh, learn from it to improve what you think that person would do? Because uh, you know, look, the U.S. goes abroad and they try to help somewhere. It, it seems to work in Liberia with an outbreak of Ebola, but it doesn't seem to work in Baghdad. So, um, and yet, when you come back, you have this feeling of satisfaction, like I made a difference, right? But if you and I were to go to Baghdad right now. We wouldn't find that difference, and this isn't yeah, to be unfair yeah. to my peers, but it is. A, so, how do you improve your ethical capability, given our 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 problem with our own fallibility? Well, again, you know, the Stoics would say the main thing is the commitment to doing right, and they would say, look, you, we're never going to get it right one hundred percent of the time, but we have to at least be committed to trying to understand the implications of our actions. You know, that doesn't mean that anything goes. It means we have to reconcile the effort to do what's in the interest of humanity with acceptance of the fact that the outcome isn't directly under our control. The Stoics call this the reserve clause. They say the wise man tries his hardest but is open to either success or failure. And he might find out that he tried his best to help people, but actually it backfired. Maybe I gave the tramp, you know, the homeless guy, uh, you know, 20 bucks and he spent it on crack or something like that. And that yeah. wasn't what I was expecting him to do. But, you know, the main thing is I try and learn from that and adapt and adjust my actions next time. But there are going to be times on the world stage or just in our relationships where despite our best intentions, the opposite happens and things actually turn out badly. And the Stoics say the main thing is that we shouldn't despair because of that. We, the main thing is we should keep trying. Like we have to keep committed to trying our best. We shouldn't just become nihilists and throw our arms up in the air. And the way we do that is by using the reserve clause, by saying I'm committed regardless to acting with wisdom and justice to the best of my ability, yeah. while simultaneously accepting that things might turn out, might not turn out as I would have wished. And then I learn from that and I adapt and I keep pushing forward. All right, one more term, and then we're going to be done with the term section of the show. But this stuff's important because it does give us uh, a lens through which to view these things, these, these conversations. So uh, I think the hardest thing to define is culture, you know, because it's not just a Picasso painting on the wall. It's it's how we design a road. It's anything. So how do you think the Stoics, again, define culture and, and how does that apply to our modern times? I'm not sure they really, it's not a subject that they broach, at least in the surviving writings. They don't talk about culture. And I suppose the reason for that might be that the Stoics were fundamentally what we call ethical cosmopolitans. Okay. They believed... Um, they liked to view humanity as a single community. And they saw, they believed that there, so for example, Marcus Aurelius says, I'm a Roman citizen and Roman emperor, but more fundamentally, I'm a citizen of the world. So I'm both. I have a commitment to my, my own citizens, I have a commitment to my own family. I have these kind of concentric circles. Like, but fundamentally I'm a human being and my most fundamental sense of kinship should be to humanity at large and then within that i have these closer circles of friends and family and neighbors and so on right but ultimately i'm a, a citizen of the the global community and you know that this was kind of the precursor of christianity like stoicism influenced christian ethics the brotherhood of man basically sure. is essentially this idea of stoic cosmopolitanism so the stoics would say we, we inherit what they call a sense of natural affection for our offspring 
um, and our mates, our spouses, our immediate family from from other animals. Like so, that's what allows us. They didn't have a concept of evolution, but they kind of had a similar idea of survival of the fittest. They knew that in order for animals to survive, they needed to have this natural pro-social tendency to form communities, to form herds or flocks, and to protect their own offspring generally speaking. And the humans kind of are born with this innate pro-social tendency. But they thought we come into the world identifying with our flesh and blood. But as we grow and mature and we become more self-aware and more rational, the Stoics believe that we increasingly identify with our minds and with our philosophy of life and with our belief system and our capacity to reason and understand. And they thought at a certain point, as we achieve greater and greater insight, we start to identify with other people, not insofar as they're genetically related to us, but insofar as they share the capacity for reason that we possess. They have a shared humanity with us, like their fellow human beings. And so they thought we kind of expand the sphere of kinship. They call yeah. it oikiosis. So we, we expand, the wise man expands his sense of kinship or family until he feels akin to the rest of humanity at some level. You know, he cares about every sentient, every uh, reasoning being, every human being in the world. Because every human being, they thought, to some extent, has the capacity for virtue and wisdom. Like, and our goal should be to try and encourage that in others as far as is possible. To turn our enemies into our friends as far as it's realistic to to do that basically yeah. generally wish you know have an attitude of philanthropy or goodwill towards others you know insofar as that's workable in life so someone like marcus aurelius has a lot of, of things to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and he's trying to do a greater good obviously a person uh -huh. at that level of leadership is going to also do a significant amount of bad either through yeah. error or just because there are no hundred percent solutions Talk to me about how he saw that, like that burden to, to get things right. Yeah, he was a busy man. He had a lot of responsibilities. It's very odd, actually, when you read the meditations, he says very little about the about world, uh, like about national politics or the wars that he's engaged in. He doesn't say a lot about them. You know, he talks kind of more about his personal relationships and, and also about his own kind of an experience as an individual human being, his relationship with humanity in general, but he doesn't talk a lot about the politics or, or uh, you know, the, the military uh, campaigns that he's involved in at the time, which is kind of striking in a way. And again, the sort of things he says are that he, at one point in the meditations, he says, look, he's committed to this I, philosophical ideal of a, an ideal society that, you know, he'd like, he'd like to bring this to bear, like, um, a free society, funnily enough, he emphasizes the concept of freedom despite being a, a Roman emperor. And he, he has an ideal that he wants to bring about in society. He wants to enlighten people. Um, but he recognizes that even as Roman emperor, as the most powerful man in the world, he has a limited capacity to do that. And he has to be satisfied if he can do it one small step at a time. And so he says, look, the main thing is we're moving in the right direction. Like I can't expect to achieve Plato's Republic overnight, he says. Right. You know, I can't. I can't expect to turn the world into a utopia overnight. You know, even though he's a Roman emperor, if he tried to kind of overturn society, he would have just been assassinated anyway. He doesn't have complete freedom to do things. So it sounds like he felt that he was kind of slogging away politically, you know, and there was a lot of kind of. Uh, you know, maneuvering involved politically, a lot of negotiations involved, and he felt he was making slow progress that could be kind of frustrating at times, but he, he told himself, I have to be satisfied as long as I'm making some progress in the right direction, you know, and I, I keep my eye fixed on the distant goal, yeah. while simultaneously accepting I'm not going to, Rome wasn't built in a day, is it? I'm not going to get there overnight. From reading the uh, the parts of the book that I was able to get to before we talk, it seems to me that Stoics focus a lot of their attention internally. Uh, you know, the outside world attempts to have an impact on them, but they're trying to keep their own personal internal ship intact. And, and that I think that's relevant as heck to these times because we can get so inflamed about so many things. And it, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, that the Stoics would say, and I would agree, that if you're able to keep yourself balanced internally, the external stuff can start to be manageable. But if you let the external absolutely dominate your internal, then nothing good happens, and, and you, you struggle to be a productive uh, person. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Right. 
<laughs> I think so. You're right. You're right. Absolutely, you're right about that. And and you know, like that's 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 sound wisdom. Um, for, you know, for the ages, and that's something that Stoics talk about a lot. So they think to put it another way, they thought that when we become overly distressed about things, or even when we crave things too much, they thought it drives us crazy. It distorts our thinking, and we become kind of irrational. They said anger is temporary madness, mm. and they were right. They didn't have cognitive psychology and the research methods that we do today that tell us that when people become inflamed with anger or anxiety or other powerful emotions, they exhibit lots of cognitive distortions. So people think less clearly when they become overly emotional uh, in many instances. And so um, Socrates actually says in Plato's Republic, there are several reasons why the wise man doesn't allow himself to become overly distressed in the face of adversity. And he says the main reason is that when he, people who become uh, overly upset about things, when people who freak out, um, it prevents them from doing the thing that's most required in the face of misfortune, and that's to think clearly and problem solve. And Socrates says that in the Republic. And the Stoics think about it the same way. Like, if we're going to deal with life, if we're going to deal with politics, if we're going to deal with other people, we have to have a clear head to do it. And if we get too worked up about things, if we're too emotionally invested, that can cloud our judgment. It's like the best example is anger. Like, often when people are angry, they just kind of want to fix the situation. But they're driving themselves crazy in the process, you know, and it, it usually backfires and they do counterproductive or harmful things. They damage their relationships and so on. That's why often in therapy we tell people, take a time out when you're feeling angry. Yeah. Wait till you've calmed down. Then think about what the best course of action is and do it, you know, like in a state of calmness. That is a piece of advice that even the ancient Pythagoreans, you know, uh, centuries before the Stoics gave, like they would say before you criticize somebody, like you should always pause, take a break, wait till you've calmed down, think about like the best way to actually go about doing it. But don't do it when you're in the throes of anger. You might regret what you've said. There's a famous anecdote about that. Hadrian, who was actually Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius's uh, predecessor. Um, it was Hadrian, then Antoninus Pius, then Marcus Aurelius. But Hadrian was, was Marcus Aurelius's adoptive grandfather. And Hadrian was a notorious mercurial, uh, fickle man, a uh, very vain man, very bad-tempered man, very different from Marcus Aurelius. And the story goes that one day he had a temper tantrum and he picked up a metal stylus, which the, the Romans used to write with, and he stabbed a slave in the eye with it. Jesus. And people were, yeah, <laughs> Jesus. So people were looking on and they were kind of horrified by this, you know, like, so even the emperor had friends and stuff and his friends were like, wow, like, you're scary. Like, we're all a bit freaked out by you now. And so eventually Hadrian calmed down and he realized that everyone was kind of like freaking out about it. And so he went back to this guy and he said, listen, I'm sorry, like, I shouldn't have done that. I lost my temper. Is there anything that I can do to make it up to you? And the story goes that the guy said, look, the only thing I really want is my eye back. And that was the one thing that Hadrian couldn't give him. Yeah. Like, and so the moral of the story is sometimes when we lose our temper, like we do things that we regret. And if we're not careful, the damage that we cause might be irreparable, even if you happen to be the most powerful man in the world. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius was very aware of that lesson he'd learned from looking at scenes like this and hearing stories like this. So he, he says in the meditation throughout, he's very careful to manage his anger like, and think about problems in a more calm and, and rational way. Hadrian's successor, Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius' adoptive father, was the opposite. He was a notoriously serene and tranquil man. He was very patient and he would think things through methodically. And he was known for never really losing his temper with anybody. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so I've got a PTSD from my time in combat, and one of the things I often struggle to sort out is, you know, in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy, is when am I dealing with life and when am I dealing with my own internal trauma? And it's tough to go, am I getting upset about this because I should be upset about, you know? And so how do you, how do you sort with that? How do you try to mark that line of, of, no, 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 you need to slow down. I'm overly angry because, you know, my brain is, is kind of rewired this way. I think one of the things that we can ask, first of all, I mean, there are various ways that you can approach that. Like, but the first thing would be a kind of fun, what we call a sort of functional analysis where you think, look, what are the consequences of this anger? Are they good or bad? Like, so sometimes that might be an easy question to answer. Other times you might need to sit down and think it through more carefully. 
So you might need to shut your eyes and just kind of visualize. If I really go with this anger and I do what it's telling me, then what would happen today, tomorrow, the day after? How's it going to work out for me in the longer term if I kind of go with these anger? And then you think, what's the alternative? Like if I take a step back from it, I take a time out, you know, I plan things through more rationally. How's that going to work out for me today, tomorrow, the day after in the longer term? And kind of like there's two, a fork in the road, two contrasting paths. You know, because they tend to diverge more as you go forward in time. So it's useful to kind of say in a month's time, two months' time, if I keep following this path, where's it going to lead me? The contrast will become wider. Right. If you see what I mean. That's an ancient technique, but you kind of you do similar things in therapy today as well. And that can kind of help you to evaluate, you know, whether or not the anger is justified or not. Is it actually helpful? You know, is it worth it? Is it doing you any good in this situation? Or is there a better way of approaching things maybe? Yeah, and, and the Stoics. And, I, I should say, by the way, I should, there's yeah. something I should add. The Stoics had a more nuanced understanding of psychology that, that many people do today, actually, and more than people assume. And in many ways, they preempted modern cognitive theories of emotion, like more, the more sophisticated modern cognitive theories of emotion. So they distinguished between voluntary and involuntary components of emotion. So the story, Seneca wrote a whole book on anger. And he said, look, there are aspects of anger that are involuntary, natural, and like a reflex. And we share them even with animals. So if someone attacks you, like it's natural to feel anger and hostility in response to that. But then there's another type of anger that's more ruminative, like that we feed off, like, you know, that we indulge in, that goes on for longer, it's more conscious. And Seneca says, like, you know, we need to learn to accept the initial flush of anger, the reflex, as being something maybe that's not under our direct control. You know, it's just a physiological reaction. You know, we need to kind of befriend it in a way, you know, accept it as inevitable, not kind of deny it or try and repress it or anything like that, quite the opposite. But accept its presence, but that doesn't mean that we need to act it out it doesn't mean we need we need to kind of swallow it or buy what it's telling us yeah, or yeah, kind yeah. of put it into practice you know but just acknowledge it and not blame ourselves for feeling it not feel ashamed of it but recognize it as a natural physical reaction and seneca says the real thing that we want to change is what happens next yeah what do we do with that initial reaction do we escalate it do we make it worse do we toss petrol in the fire like or do we take a step back from it and process it in a more calm and rational manner? Okay, so I'm angry. Yeah. You know, like, let me understand where that's coming from. What would be the best way to deal with this? Or do we just go crazy and turn into the Hulk and like wallow in it or you know lash out at people? So it's the, the what is the what happens next that the Stoics are really interested in changing. Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, because you and and, and <laughs> not new knowledge apparently. But the, uh, the whole thing, like, there's so many instances where this works. So oftentimes people talk about fight or flight response, but the limbic brain has a third response of freeze. And this is, this is it right here, right? Like, my response is triggered to fight, in this case, with anger. But really the correct response, the evolved response, is to, is to freeze, slow down, sort, and then make a, a calculated decision, you know, based on either – design or going against your design by design absolutely brilliant stuff there and same thing with so many different things that we encounter day to day like uh, for example um, our own pre-wiring to a given situation whether it's racial or cultural or whatever i know that this response is initial i'm going to let it pass and then go to the next more reasoned response i, I love that man that's that's fantastic that's super that's super useful thank you this episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. I love that, man. That's that's fantastic. That's super not super useful. Thank you for writing that down. All right. So in terms of Marcus Aurelius as a so your book is it's like three things, it seems to me. Yeah. It's part biography. Obviously it, it deals with this uh the stoicism stuff. Mm-hmm. What was that by design? Yeah, I mean it's funny, I'll tell you funny, so my publisher were a bit confused by that at first because they were like, look, Donald, 
we need to explain something to you. They said, like, you know, when books go in a bookshop, you know, there's a, a shelf that's got history books in it, and there's another shelf that's got self-help books in it, and then there's another shelf that's got psychology books in it. And when we sell books, we need to tell them what shelf it goes on. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and you're kind of talking about something that really tries to weld all three things together. There's history, philosophy, and psychology in it, like, and kind of self-help. So it's a bit of a mash of different things. But what I had to explain to them is that these things only – were divided up almost after the industrial revolution like um like division of labor you know like before um like the greek philosophers did all of these things combined like they, they didn't really think of them as being completely separate subjects to begin with so and that's cool it's nice to be able to integrate them it, it's wrong in a way that we treat them as separate subjects like when plutarch wrote his lives uh, uh, you know he was teaching moral he was doing history he was doing yeah. biography great men but it's to teach moral lessons and psychological lessons, to teach qualities about leadership. You know, he wasn't just doing history for its own sake. You know, in the ancient world, these things were all intertwined. And the Stoics were, you know, were very aware of that. They thought we can study the lives of, like, uh, predecessors and learn from them. We can role model them. You know, and philosophy and psychology and personal improvement are all really different aspects of the same subject. They hadn't been pulled apart for them. And so, it, you know, one way we can try and bring these things back together in the modern world is by going back to what they were like, you know, 2,000 years ago before they were separated, yeah. you know, and looking at that as an approach. And it, it gives us actually, funnily enough, a kind of fresh perspective on things. And, and I think if people find it more enjoyable, you know, when we talk about history, we're doing storytelling. And that's the way I like to approach it. And, uh, you know, when we do cognitive therapy, when we're teaching it to people, sometimes it can feel like we're lecturing them about theory and there's a place for that. But people also find it easier to learn when you tell them a wee story. Like yeah. the little story I told you about Hadrian, for example, a moment ago, you know, thinking about how anger can blind us and the consequences of it and how we might be, not be able to walk back everything that we do when we're in a fit of anger. And like these little kind of stories, people often find easy to remember, you know, and more relatable than, than just spelling things out in abstract theoretical terms. So it is a mishmash of these different genres and deliberately so. When you look at the, the, the Stoic peers, you know, the the Greek guys going way back, all of them, Seneca, uh, well, Cato, you know, over there in Italy and everything. How do these guys, how do these guys respond to today? If you started up and you put them in their university in the, I don't know, in Kansas, and they started looking around, how, how do they deal with this modern world? Oh, they'd be very confused by it, I think, in some ways. Although, you know, like in the ancient world, like the Greeks and, and more so the Romans even were kind of, Educated people in those times were relatively cosmopolitan. They'd seen other cultures, you know, they'd studied other cultures. They, some of them had traveled, you know, so they kind of got the idea that different people had different values and there were different religions and, and ways of life. Some, some of them were, people like Marcus Aurelius were, were you know, were kind of wise to that. So they, they'd definitely be pretty confused about the modern world. But, you know, they'd be like, well, we've seen barbarian races in our own time and we know that, you know, things are different in different countries, you know. But they, the, the Stoics were kind of universalists. They believed that fundamentally human nature is the same the world over. We all have a capacity for reason. Yeah. And, you know, I think the essence of Stoic morality, in a way, again, it goes back to Socrates. What's distinctive about human beings is that we're reasoning animals. I mean, maybe other animals can reason in, a, in other ways. They can make tools and use them and stuff. But human beings certainly have a, a, a significantly different capacity, more evolved capacity for reason, self-awareness and language use. And the Stoics thought that's, that seems to be fundamental to our very nature. We identify with our minds. If someone said, would you rather like we destroy your body and you get to keep your mind or would you rather we destroy your mind and you get to keep your body that's a no-brainer right we'd yeah. all be like well we'll identify with my mind my personality you know i will you know what's the point in surviving and your body surviving if your mind is gone you know that you might as well be dead because we identify with our minds and so socrates and the stoic said look if that's the essence of our personality is our capacity to reason and think and to be self-aware then you know, our fundamental duty to ourselves and in life in general is to think well, like to do the best that we can and to excel at applying reason in daily life would be what we mean by wisdom, moral wisdom. 
So Socrates would say, well, what, if we take this ability and we do the best that we can with it, that would be wisdom. That's what we're talking about. So, you know, I think it, that's one way of understanding the, the goal of Stoicism. And the Stoics would say, look, even in the modern world, like it still boils down to this fundamental thing to think clearly and rationally, like to think fairly and objectively about things, even though the culture seems very different. But they would look at the internet and social media and consumerism and celebrity culture and, and they would think, yeah, this is a, it's a shit show, right? <laughs> like, my modern, modern world is rubbish in many respects. It's like we're surrounded by these things that are dragging us down, yeah. blinding us. But they had that even in their own time, they complained about it. You know, the Stoics said, look, it feels like we're swimming against the tide. We're undergoing what they called an epistrophe, like a U-turn in our morality. They said everyone, all the other Romans are obsessed with power and reputation and wealth like same as we're obsessed with celebrity culture and reality TV and consumerism and I, you know, iPhones and stuff today. It's just a different version of the same thing. But the Stoics thought everyone's heading in the wrong direction. They've been misled. Like you know, they've been sold this bill of goods that says life is all about um, having the biggest house, having 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 the, the most uh, uh, important friends. Like, you know, having the most beautiful wife and all this kind of stuff, being the most famous guy in town. And that's not really what, you know, nobody really fundamentally believes this if they think about it. It's not really what life's about. Right. You know, it won't make you happy. You know, true happiness comes from within, the Stoics would say. There are people that are much poorer than us. Like, you know, there are people that have fewer friends and they're much happier. Right. Like, because they know the art of living. Guy, they said Socrates was ridiculed. He was executed. They, they made fun of him and publicly they wrote satires about him um, mercilessly. Um, he lived in poverty, he went around barefoot. Um, but the Stoics would say, well, would, his, would Socrates' life have been made better if we gave him a bunch of money yeah. like, and we made him more popular? <laughs> I'd say, not really. Like, because even though he faced all of this adversity, he to them, he was an iconic hero because he stood up against it and he exhibited tremendous courage and dignity. You know, and in a way, ironically, it was the fact that he was poor and persecuted that gave him an opportunity to exhibit strength of character and moral wisdom and kind of made him the man that he was. So they would argue, well, like, ironically, you need a certain amount of hardship and a certain amount of resistance in order to actually flourish as a human being. Yeah. Um, but we all make the mistake of thinking that our happiness turns on all these external things. When it, you know, in fact, it doesn't. They, one of the things they like to say is the wise man needs nothing, but he uses everything well, whereas the fool feels like he needs lots and lots of things yeah. and he uses them all badly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... <laughs> yeah, that's really... And it's funny how right the Greeks got it and how many things they identified that are still... Like problems which are still trying to swim up the same river, you know? Uh uh, I did want to uh, take a time out and say, I wonder if Aristophanes would be pissed off because everybody mm. stole his ideas and he hasn't had a royalty check in 2,000 years. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so when we look at like our time, at least in America and, and a lot of other places too, we seem to be so divided. And, and really the scariest place where the most work can be done is squarely in the middle, I, I would submit. That you know, if you resist the temptations of being on either side of a political thing, and you think about like how do we help humanity as this, instead of a, a party or you know a thing, but but is it is it also fair to say that people, I don't know, even at the DNA level, that they're wired to look instead of internally, they're wired to help externally, and that's and that's their philosophy, and it's equally appropriate, if if not confusing to those of us that are focused on internal calm and, and resilience. Yeah, I mean, the, this like the Stoics thought we need to go through a kind of, the Stoics thought we need to mature, we need to go through a kind of transformation in order to rise above our natural inclination to be overly attached to external things. And they thought most, they, their way of approaching things was they looked at the Greek tragedies and, and they said, you know, the funny thing about the Greek tragedies is none of them needed to be tragic. Like, they're, they're all the stories of people, really, that caused their own problems because they got overly, they, too hung up on external things. 
Um, so Medea, for example, is one of their favourite uh, stories. She murders her own children yeah. to get back at her lover Jason because he goes off with another woman. And the story say this is only a tragedy because she got so pissed off about Jason. You know, if she wasn't so attached to Jason, if she just kind of went, meh, it doesn't really matter. I can, <laughs> yeah. you know, I can deal with it. You know, there would be no tragedy. But it was because she placed absolute importance on something that wasn't under her direct control. Like she drove herself crazy and did something atrocious and horrifying. She said that these tragedies are all tragedies of the lead character's own making. Like uh, Oedipus uh, sleeps with his own mother, not realizing who she is because of a twist of fate. And then he goes crazy and blinds himself. And, uh, you know, like, again, the, the story said there wouldn't be any tragedy if you just thought, well, it wasn't intentional, so I'm not really to blame for it. There's nothing inherently, yeah. you know, I, it's, it's just a thing that happened externally. Like, it's, uh, an ex, an ex, it's morally indifferent at the end of the day. All, what matters is my intentions, and I didn't intend to do that. Like, they thought, well, you know, but he sees it differently. He attaches absolute importance to something that happened that's outside of his knowledge or his direct control, and therefore he drives himself crazy as a result. So they saw these Greek tragedies as all like studies in psychopathology. Mm -hmm. And they say they're all examples of people driving themselves crazy because they place too much importance on things that are outside their direct control and not enough importance on their own uh, ability to take responsibility for the, the way they look at things. Uh, the perspective that they choose to adopt on them. So I think we can learn a lot from the, the, the Stoics in that regard. And in terms of the kind of divisiveness and so on of modern culture, I really, I do think that the Stoics had a tendency to be more kind of bipartisan, um, you know, to be more willing to compromise, like with other people in certain respects. Like, and, and one of the main things is, you know, not, not thinking of any particular, you know, politi contemporary political figures and so on, but actually a whole bunch of them would fall into this category. The, the Stoics said that the first art of kingship is not to take offense at other people. Yeah. Like to be able to take criticism on the chin, you know, not to be easily offended. The first art of kingship is not to be easily, is to learn not to be easily offended by others, to have a tough skin, right? Because people are going to criticize you. And there, Aristophanes, a student of Socrates, who was a kind of uh, one of the, the links between Socrates and the Stoics, uh, he said, uh, it is kingly to do good and yet be spoken of ill. Yeah. Like, so he says, uh, strength of character, you know, and particularly being a good ruler, consists in the ability to stick to your moral principles even if people are calling you an idiot or insulting you or disagreeing with you, not to be swayed by insults and also not to be swayed too much by flattery, not sure. to be an narcissist and so on, but to learn to be your own man like, and make your own decisions and think for yourself, listening to other people, but not being you know, overly swayed one direction or, or the other at an emotional level by other people's opinions of you. And I feel like there's too much of that in modern politics. It's all caught up with appearances you know, and, uh, and and people insulted, throwing insults back and forth and so on, you know, and there's not enough capacity for people to, you know, rise above that and think clearly above the storm. And I think, you know, hopefully the pendulum will swing back again, you know, and there'll be a time for people to step forward into their political arena that show a little bit more detachment in that respect and a little bit more objectivity and a little bit more willingness to engage in rational dialogue rather than kind of much the sort of mudslinging that we see at the moment yeah when you talked about the being hard to offend that uh, is absolutely uh, a thing this uh, representative from texas he's a former navy seal he's got a patch on his eyes maybe you've seen him in the news but that's his oh, line. that's what he says yeah. so, so i want to be hard to offend and i don't want to offend you know like those are his goals and that's uh that's straight out of the uh, aristophanes playbook the guy that was an SNL. Yeah, yeah. That guy. Yeah, I don't know his name. I'm not. I'm not that clued up in American politics. But I know the guy you mean. That's right. Yeah. But that's a virtue, you know. Yeah. And I feel that there are a lot of American politicians that are getting interested in stoicism. And interestingly, although some Democrats, like Bill Clinton, was into Marcus Aurelius, but it seems like more of them are from the Republican side that that have an interest in. Um, there was a guy called Pat McGeehan, an American politician, who wrote a book called Stoicism in the State House recently about the relevance of Stoic philosophy to modern Republican politics. Yeah. So it seems, I feel like um, there are fig, people, individuals involved in modern politics who want to kind of get back to a more principled, a more rational 
approach to what they're doing and, and kind of you know get beyond the, the kind of dirty politics that and the the politics of appearances that, that, that we've had in the past um you know i mean a lot of these guys are sincere people and they got sure. into it because they want to help other people you know and i think some of them feel disillusioned by what they see going on around them in the political world you know and there's, there's a genuine craving in them to kind of get back to some kind of uh, link between ethics and politics yeah there does seem to be at least here in america i'll speak to like i can speak to that it seems that like uh, the left side of the equation their their approach is a hand up we want to help everybody you know the raising mm-hmm. tide raise all boats and then the right would say, we're going to bootstrap. We, we want to build resilient, tough people that do things themselves and act as a community, all built from resilience. And uh, two viable ways to do it, but we can't seem to agree. If if the right sort of appears to, you know, lean towards stoicism, what, what would be the philosophical, the philosophical approach of the left? Do you have a sense for who they're following? See, you know... Um... I don't actually, I can't, I can't really speak to that. But what I was going to say about Stoicism is that sometimes people try to say, is, are the Stoics more aligned with Democrats or Republicans? They're yeah. kind of more left or right wing. And they, they do, the ancient Stoics, actually, Stoicism originated out of a political treatise, called, which is lost now. We've lost most of the books in Stoicism. Um, but Zeno wrote a book called The Republic, right. which was a, a response to Plato's Republic. Um, and we only know tiny little fragments of information about it. But it was almost like a kind of utopian vision that he was describing of a kind of anarchist society in a way. But it, it doesn't fit neatly into modern political categories because the Stoics believed in a society um, where they don't seem to have thought like people should have individual property, but they do seem to have thought people should have taken much more responsibility for their yeah. own character and their own life. So they, they kind of fall between these two stools in a way in terms of the things that attract both the left and the right to them. But the main thing they would say is, and this goes back to Socrates as well, see, the Stoics would say, look, when we think about helping or harming other people, um, instinctively we tend to think about it in a superficial manner, like taking away their physical freedom or giving them freedom or giving them money um, or other material assets to help them. And, the, you know, the Stoics and Socrates said, look, the most important thing in life is strength of character and moral wisdom. Like, because then people can flourish even in, in dire straits and they can do more with the things that are available to them. So to put it very crudely, they would have said the best way to help other people is education. Yeah. Like, that's the main thing. Like, and Socrates had a very famous paradox about that. There was a Greek saying that justice consists in helping your friends and harming your enemies. And in Plato's Republic, Socrates tackles that. And he basically says, uh, I think that's wrong. He says, I think justice consists in helping your friends and helping your enemies. And his friends are like, that's crazy. You know, like, why, yeah. why would you want to help your enemies? And Socrates basically says, well, it depends what you mean by helping people. If it just means giving them like money and handouts and stuff like that, yeah, it would be crazy to help your enemies. But if the most important thing in life is enlightenment and moral wisdom, you know, then helping their enemies in that more fundamental sense would mean educating them. And educating them would mean t- potentially transforming them into your friends. Yeah. Like, and Socrates says, you, you know, in that sense, like we should approach it like with this attitude of universal philanthropy, you know. And even sometimes you might have to punish people. You might even have to go to war against people. But the fundamental desire should be to enlighten them and to improve them and educate them and turn them into our friends and allies, you know, not just be punishing people for the sake of or viewing them as the other or the enemy or whatever. You know, the ultimate goal is to live in harmony and turn enemies into friends, and you know, like unify humanity. Yeah. Like, you know, like have a brotherhood of man and all that kind of stuff. Although sometimes there might be ugly means that have to be employed in the defense of the state and so on to get there. Marcus Aurelius went to war. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't, he wasn't a warmonger. Like, you know, he tried to assimilate the the barbarians into the Roman Empire because he wanted a lasting peace. Um, so the Stoics would say, look, we, we, we believe that we should help our friends and help our enemies, but that means fundamentally not giving them stuff, but educating them, empowering them, like allowing them, like, you know, like uh, teaching a man to fish. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, that's the ultimate goal. And in fact, that mean, that might mean that sometimes when we're, if we're helping our friends in that sense, it might mean sometimes denying them things or being tough on them. 
play in order to strengthen their character like, and empower them at the end of the day. Same as you, with your children. Helping your children just doesn't mean giving them like, lots of money and candy and everything that they ask for. Oh, you know, really? Sometimes it's tough love. Yeah. <laughs> you'd think, you'd, you know, you'd think uh, uh, people would realise that. But, uh, yeah, some people some people do seem to raise their kids that way. But it, it, the Stoics would say, well, the same way that we think about our children, we, we should think about humanity in general. You know, like we should think at a smarter, more insightful level about what it actually means to do good in society. And it doesn't just mean handouts, you know. It means trying to enlighten other people so that they're more capable of living harmoniously together. Like, and the, story, the way that they would phrase that is it, like, it means cultivating friendships wherever possible, building alliances to strengthen society. You know, when I think about the, the great leaders of the past that I've studied, someone like Abraham Lincoln, if you bring him to today's context, you're like, gosh, you really said some really bigoted, hateful, racist shit in your yeah. speeches. So uh-huh. where does where does Marcus Aurelius fall short? I mean, nobody's perfect. Where where would we want him to have improved? I mean, sometimes it's you can only do what's possible in your time and see what's possible. But how, how do we yeah. provide critique on his stoicism? Well, absolutely. Look, I mean, and whenever you write about history, you always have this problem. And in some ways, it's a bigger problem with Socrates, actually, that you're talking about a different culture, different moral values. Of course, it's easy to go through and pick out things that these guys took for granted that would seem shocking to them. They own slaves, right? Sure. You know, they treated women as, almost as if they were slaves. Um, you know, they said racist and bigoted things. Um, you know, like without a shadow of doubt, they had some strange opinions that, that seem like anachronistic to us. Although that said, I would say there's evidence, there's some evidence that the Stoics actually questioned the institution of slavery. You know, there were philosophers even two and a half thousand years ago, like they questioned the whole institution of slavery. And in Marcus Aurelius's case, if we look very closely at his life, we can see that he was doing things to try and change some aspects of Roman society. So he didn't overturn the institution of slavery. But he did grant more freedoms to slaves. Like he did improve their rights, like he did improve their circumstances. When the Romans conquered enemy tribes, like they might either kill them or enslave them or recruit them into the army. And we know that Marcus tended to resettle captured enemies, recruit them into the army rather than uh, killing them or enslaving them. So he tried to approach things in, in I guess, a more progressive way in in that sense that would be a little bit more in keeping with with modern values. He was, again, small steps, heading a bit closer towards the the start of values that we had today. But, you know, in my book, I do kind of paint a more positive picture of his character. There's a reason for that, because we're we're trying to use him as a role model and see what we can learn from him but and 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 so it would be a kind of different sort of history to say well what would be a more balanced perspective you know what did he do that we might criticize and actually we're helped in that by and even in the roman histories that survive which are very biased they do list gossip about him and criticisms that were made of him and so you know people tended to say that um, he was too lenient towards his wife who is uh, was allegedly unfaithful towards him although we don't know to what extent that was gossip or if it was true many people blame marcus for allowing his son commodus to succeed him who's often seen as one of the worst roman emperors a very corrupt individual um and again that's a kind of complicated story my belief is that he didn't have a lot of choice yeah you know he couldn't have he couldn't execute his own son and if he uh, bypassed him and uh, installed someone else as emperor then they, he would have risked causing a civil war sure. because Commod would have always been in the wings as a rival emperor and the senate were terrified of that you know because they were f- frightened that the east of the empire could always break away yeah like if they had a, another figurehead or they didn't want rival emperor empire rival emperors competing for control and and so you know uh, and, bypassing- and some problems are for somebody else to solve like you you know i'm moving yeah. the ball this far but uh you know this is going to be for you guys to figure out, you know? Yeah, he realized, you know, Marcus was always telling himself, look, I'm not going to live forever and there's a limit to what I can do here. You know, one day I'll be gone and they won't even remember my name, you know, although we do remember him today. But he reminded himself of that quite often. You know, I have to accept the fact that, you know, things will go on without me after my death and I don't have any control over that. All I can do is the best that I can do with the time that's allotted to me. But, you know, one of the main criticisms I would say it seems to me that, that we know Marcus had critics because there was a civil war against him. 
And I, I talk about that towards the end of the book. So clearly, like there, there were a faction of people in the Senate and in the military that didn't like him and were willing to actually, you know, have a, an uprising against him, although it was kind of short lived. And it, it seems to me like that that argument was about the guy that headed that Avidius Cassius was known for his severity as a military commander both with his in instilling discipline in his own troops and his severity towards the enemy in order to to kind of uh, instill fear in them um so there's a story about and uh, he took the Sarmatians once and erected a a huge wooden pole and bound like dozens and dozens of the enemy to it and put it up on a hill and set it on fire so that people for miles around could see these guys being burnt alive wow. to send out a message not to mess with the Romans as it yeah. were. And, and other Romans like Marcus thought that was uh, inhumane, that it, it, was, it was brutal. And so Marcus took a long time to fight the war in the north. He spent a lot of time negotiating with the many tribes that were involved. And I, I, it was expensive for the Romans and many like Roman lives were lost in the process. But you could argue that he was taking his time and trying to secure a more lasting peace. Yeah. Whereas Avidius Cassius wanted a more short and sharp solution. You know, like they perhaps thought, look, we could have this war over with more quickly. You know, like if we just go in and kill a lot of these guys and burn their villages down and stuff like that. You know, but Marcus maybe thought this is inhumane or maybe it's not also not in our longer term interest to right. do it this way. So you could say Marcus was maybe more of a dove and uh, Vidius Cassius more of a hawk. And so the criticism was maybe he's t taking it too slowly. You know, like he's not showing enough aggression, you know, and there was obviously some tension about that during sure. his lifetime. Yeah, Th there's an age old problem. OK, so I'm going to give you a choice between uh, the last two questions. You can answer which one you want. Are there are there proto stoics in the Sumerian text at all that we know and see? Or uh, what would Marcus Aurelius look at us and go, I really want you guys to have had this part figured out by now. So I'll let you take whichever one you want. Well, I don't know. So, I don't know so much about the Sumerian text. So I'll take the latter one. All right. I think if he was looking at us today, you know, it would be the central message of Stoicism. He'd say, "Look, I can't believe that you guys are still." <laughs> I think the Stoics would say, "Like, I can't believe you guys are still getting so worked up about things." Yeah. Basically, <laughs> like he would say that this the most famous quote from the Stoic literature is, "It's not things that upset us, but our judgments about them." This is passage five in the Enchiridion, or Handbook of Epictetus. And Marcus paraphrases it several times. Um, it's not things that upset us, but our judgments about them. And that became famous in the modern era because the founders of cognitive behavioral therapy used to quote that to their clients. It encapsulates what we call today the cognitive theory of emotion, that the emotions that we feel are largely determined by our underlying beliefs. Right. And the Stoics thought those beliefs being mainly beliefs about our values, uh, value judgments, as it were, in life what we think is important and so on and i think marcus would say i can't believe that you guys still are you know acting as if someone uh you know insulting you uh if someone calls you an asshole that there's something inherently distressing about that right rather than realizing that you know th if they said it to someone else they might just laugh their head off at them or they said it to someone else they might just ignore the like it's water off a duck's back to them or someone, or someone else would have a, a, you know, their blood pressure would shoot through the roof, like, and they and they freak out when they hear that. And the Stoics would say people respond differently to these kind of stimuli or provocations. And doesn't that tell you it's all determined by our attitude, yeah. by the perspective that we choose to adopt on it? You know, and knowing that, shouldn't we take more responsibility, like, for having a, a kind of healthy attitude towards things? You know, one that preserves our own rationality and equanimity. Um, you know, they would say it's, surpri it's surprising in a way that we're still struggling with this very simple, like basic insight that we need to learn to take more responsibility. The way we expl explain it in, uh, in cognitive therapy is it's imagine you're wearing rose tinted glasses. So everything in the world kind of looks happy and rose tinted. But if you're depressed, you might be wearing dark blue glasses. So everything looks sad and blue. You know, or if you're angry, maybe it's all fiery red or it's all kind of shitty colored or something. And the Stoics would say, look, you know, stupidity or foolishness consists in thinking, oh, look, the world actually is rose tinted or what, look, the world actually is blue. Yeah. And wisdom consists in realizing, no, that's just the glasses that I'm looking through. Like, and I could take these off and swap them for other glasses if I really wanted to. And there's a guy over there wearing a different color glasses from me, but he's looking at the same thing. And the Stoics would say, look, wisdom consists in realizing that those are just the lenses you're looking through. Like, 
whether it's happy or it's sad, you know, those are value judgments that you project onto events. The thing in itself is morally indifferent. Like, you know, all the distress that you're experiencing comes from what you project onto it. They would say that's our most basic insight. Two and a half thousand years later, like half of you guys still haven't even figured that out. I think that's what they'd, that's what they'd <laughs> upbraid us about. <laughs> that's a great answer. I love it. Hey, so this is Donald Robertson. Uh, his book is called How to Think Like a Roman, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And you guys, you know how it works. So first off, I have the book. I bought it. It's excellent. I'm not finished it yet, but I will. Um, go on to Amazon, rate it, review it. And, and that's how you help Donald sell more books and support him. And I, you know, I would love to have you back on to talk more about this stuff because I could go all day talking about stoicism and how it applies to life. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about my hobby. Yeah, thanks <laughs> for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure.